a lot of history in this chapter. Okay, J.J. Thompson, 1856 to 1940. He made something called a cathode ray tube. So he took a, a glass tube, and it was partially evacuated. So there's a little bit of gas in there, but not very much. And he passed electric current through this glass tube, and he would get this beam. So it kind of lights up. So this beam of particles was called a cathode ray because it traveled from the cathode to the anode. The cathode has a negative charge. The anode has a positive charge. And it, it is a beam of particles. Well, Thompson um, studied this cathode ray, and he found that the cathode ray has this, um, the particles in the cathode ray have these properties. They travel in straight lines. Um, they are independent of the composition of the material from which they originate. So if we look at this tube again, this cathode is made out of some kind of metal. It doesn't matter what you make it out of. The cathode rays are the same. So that was kind of interesting. And the cathode rays carry a negative electrical charge. That, in fact, is why they leave the negative anode, cathode and they travel towards the positive cathode, because opposite electrical charges are attracted to each other. Electrical charge is a fundamental property of some particles that results in attractive and repulsive forces. So this is what we need to know about electrical charge. Opposite charges, positive and negative, will be attracted to each other. Like charges will repel each other. Electrical charges act a lot like magnets. We've all played around with magnets. They can be kind of fun, right? If you, my kids have Brio trains, right? And so they have these little magnets on the ends to connect them together. And if you get them lined up right, they'll hook together. If you turn one of those cars around, then they'll push each other apart because you've got the two south poles or two north poles of the magnets. Same idea with the charges. If you have two negatives, they'll repel each other. Two positives will repel each other, but a positive and a negative will attract each other. And if we have the same magnitude of charge, plus one and minus one, when we put them together overall, the pair of them will not have a charge. They'll sum to zero. So he continued to study these cathode rays, and he was able to measure the charge to mass ratio by using a combination of electric fields and magnetic fields to deflect them. So this is a slightly different looking cathode ray tube. So here's the generator, the, the anode makes the cathode ray and the cathode ray is particles and they have um, charges, excuse me, negative charges. And so by applying an electric field um, he could cause the beam to deflect. You can cause it to bend to one side or the other. And how much it bends depends on the charge on the particles. It also depends on the mass of the particles. He couldn't measure either of those independently, but he could measure the ratio. And he found that the ratio of, mass, of charge to mass was negative 1.76 times 10 to the third coulombs per gram. You don't need to memorize that. Coulomb is a unit of charge. What this implied was that that cathode ray particle was about 2,000 times lighter than hydrogen, which was the smallest and lightest known atom. This was uh, a bit mind-blowing for these people because they believed that the atom was the smallest particle. So how could you have these cathode ray particles that are 2,000 times smaller than the atom. The atom must be composed of smaller pieces because here they've chipped little pieces off of the atom. This was incredible. What he had discovered was the electron. The electron is a negatively charged particle, very low mass, that is found within all atoms. And that's why the cathode rays were the same regardless of the material of the anode because all atoms have electrons in them and all electrons are the same. So this was the first evidence that all atoms of different elements are actually composed of the same fundamental particles. 
so this was kind of crazy. Um, Milliken, Robert Milliken, 1909, he did a, an experiment with oil drops. And I've got a video to show you, but let's, let's talk about this setup he's got here. He used this to figure out the charge on a single electron. What I think is really fascinating about some of these experiments that were done in the past is they are simple enough that we can actually understand what's going on without an advanced degree if you put a little thought into it. Today's experiments involve so much knowledge and technology that they're hard to understand, even for someone with a degree. And these guys were working in really very primitive conditions. They had electricity now in 1909, but you know they still just didn't know a whole lot of stuff. So he has this chamber, and he's got an atomizer here, much like a perfume atomizer, and he's spraying little tiny oil droplets into this chamber. And of course, droplets are going to be susceptible to gravity, and so they're going to fall down. This, this uh, level here has a single hole in the center, because he didn't want all of these oil droplets coming down. He just wanted a few in the center. So the oil droplets that happen to fall through this hole in the floor would come down here. And then he would take ionizing radiation and blast them with ionizing radiation. What this did is it gave those oil particles a charge. When they have a charge on them, you can use an electric field to influence their movement. And so he's got a negatively charged plate here. This is a positively charged plate. So if we have a negative particle here, it's going to be attracted to the electric field on the positive plate, and it's going to be repelled by the, the negative charge on the lower plate. And if you get it just right, if you get the uh, charges on those plates just right compared to the charge on the particle, you can get that oil droplet to just hang in midair. If you make the top, the positive charge, too strong, then the particles will actually rise, seeming to defy the law of gravity. If you make this too weak, then they'll continue to fall. So that's the basic idea. And this um, viewing microscope over here is so he could watch the particles. So let's see this YouTube video. In a series of experiments carried out between 1908 and 1917, R.A. Milliken succeeded in measuring the charge of the electron with great precision. In his experiment, a fine mist of oil was sprayed into the upper chamber with an atomizer. Some of the tiny oil droplets fell through the hole in the upper floor, and Milliken was able to determine the mass of an oil drop from its terminal velocity. Next, Milliken used an X-ray source to ionize gas molecules in the chamber. Electrons from this ionization process adhere to the oil droplets. The oil droplets now carry a negative charge. The negatively charged oil droplets can be halted by adjusting the voltage across the two plates. As the voltage across the plates is increased, the velocity of the oil drops slows. As the voltages increase further, some drops will begin to move upward toward the positive plate. If the voltage is set just right, an oil drop can be suspended. When an oil drop is suspended, its weight, mass times acceleration due to gravity, is exactly counterbalanced by the electric force applied. The electric force applied equals the applied electric field, E, times the charge on the drop, Q. Since the mass of the oil drop, the acceleration due to gravity, and the applied electric field are known, Millikan could solve for Q, which is the charge on the drop. Millikan found that droplets had different charges, but each was a whole number multiple of a smaller charge, equal to negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Millikan concluded that this was the fundamental unit of charge, the charge of an electron. From the charge of an electron and the charge to mass ratio of an electron determined by Thompson using a cathode ray tube, Millikan was able to calculate the mass of an electron. The mass of an electron, 9.10 times 10 to the negative 28 grams, is an exceedingly small mass. Hey, what I think is really cool about experiments like this is there's no way that you can measure the mass of an electron. It's way too small. And yet, by doing an experiment like this, they were able to calculate the mass. So they've got these droplets falling, and they apply a charge on the plates 
to freeze one in place, and then they can calculate the charge on the droplet. That droplet may have one, two, three, four, five extra electrons on it from the ionizing radiation. And so they were all different charges, but he found that they were all multiples of this smallest charge. And so they figured out that the, um, this number, 1.96 times 10 to the minus 19th, um, was the charge on an individual electron. And then they did this calculation um, using the mass to charge ratio. So this known, um, I think something, I don't know. That's, it's not looking right to me. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Anyway, they were able to calculate the mass of the electron. Any questions? I'm not going to test you on that experiment, but I want you to know about it. I want you to have had it explained to you because the question of how did we find this stuff out is something that we should be curious about.